Nimrud Sultani is a civil rights attorney in Israel and a doctoral candidate at Harvard Law School. In this installment of Palestine Studies TV, we will discuss recent measures passed by the Knesset that impact Palestinian citizens of Israel. You are watching Palestine Studies TV. I'm your host, Will Yeomans. Nimr, welcome to our show and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Will. In late March, Israel's legislative body, the Knesset, passed two laws initiated by the Israeli right. One of the laws would let certain Jewish majority communities reject Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel and other quote-unquote unsuitable applicants for residency. Why was this law passed? So this uh, specific law was a uh, culmination of the efforts by the Israeli legislator to circumvent the ruling of the Israeli Supreme Court in the Qadam decision uh, in, uh, of 1999, in which the Supreme Court uh, prohibited the state from discriminating against Arab citizens or allowing discrimination by third parties, such as the quasi-state uh, Zionist organs, uh, in terms of allocation of land and settlement within uh, Israel itself. Uh, of course, the Supreme Court was, uh, this was a modest ruling by the Supreme Court uh, because it ignored the history of uh, land gra grab policies and discrimination and allocation of land uh, since the establishment of the state. And it, it did allow for uh, the loophole that is now being used by this law, which is the admission uh, committees. And, but despite this modest ruling by the Supreme Court, the Israeli Knesset was not uh, satisfied and wanted to and legalize and give a legal shield for this loophole that now is being used uh, more and more, uh, which is uh, through the code names such as uh, social incompatibility and uh, deci as decided by the residents of these gated communities uh, through admission committees in which uh, weak uh, sectors of the population, specifically that of citizens, uh, citizens will be and are uh, being uh, excluded. And of course, this uh, specific law is an, uh, one specific expression of the uh, rejection of the Israeli legislator of, uh, of the principle of equality. Uh, as you know, uh, there have been different attempts by specifically Arab legislators to introduce the principle of equality into the laws, that is, equal protection of the laws for all citizens, regardless of who they are and what is their origin and their political orientation and gender and sex and so on. But this was rejected again and again by an overwhelming majority of the uh, Israeli Knesset. And the Supreme Court, in a decision like other, was basically trying to introduce the principle of equality in specific areas, but this specific law is trying to uh, prevent any such attempts. How serious is the impact of this new law? So this, this uh, law basically uh, has two main uh, effects. The first effect is to uh, reproduce and continue the uh, de facto segregation. Uh, between the Arab citizens and the Jewish citizens inside Israel. As you know, more than 90%, I think uh, 92% uh, uh, approximately of the Arab citizens are living within their own uh, Arab communities, and only 8% live within the Jewish communities and uh, with what's, uh, the so-called uh, mixed communities. But even in these communities, basically the Arab citizens are living in their own gated uh, neighborhoods that are separated um, from the uh, uh, Jewish towns. And even when you have adjacent communities such as Caesarea and Jesuzarka, you have also uh, physical uh, obstructions, separa physical separation between these communities in order to enhance the separation. So the second uh, effect is the fact that there will be le it will hinder the development of these, uh, the Arab community and its uh, mo uh, mobility within uh, the country. As you know, the Arab towns are. Uh, overpopulated uh, uh, communities in which there are uh, dire economic conditions. More, we are talking about more than 56% of the uh, Arab families inside Israel are poor, 60% of the poor uh, children inside Israel are Palestinian, and 60% of the uh, Palestinian children uh, are poor. So obviously those Arab citizens who are trying to move to uh, non-Arab uh, communities are are those who are trying to, uh, trying to look for a, a higher quality of life. And these laws will allow admission committees to refuse them uh, this kind of uh, mobility. This law refers to smaller kind of upstart communities. Are there new Arab uh, communities being formed within Israel? And we don't see any establishment of other towns or new towns and new uh, localities uh, for the Arab citizens. And since 1948, we saw uh, more than 600 uh, Jewish communities that have been established by the state, 
but not a single uh, Arab community. So we have more population because since 1948 we have uh, in 1948, we had 156,000 uh, Palestinian citizens, and now we have uh, 1.3 million or so. So you have an increase of the population, a decrease in the land, because 80% of the Palestinian land has been uh, confiscated. The private property of the Palestinian citizens in Israel have been confiscated since 1948. No new uh, Arab uh, towns and localities and no mobility into uh, Jewish community. So this will create a, 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 ghetto, a ghettoization of the Palestinian population inside Israel. The other law passed by the Knesset permits Israel to penalize any state-funded institution that commemorates the Nekba, or quote-unquote denies the existence of the State of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. What's the aim of such legislation? Obviously, this is an ideological uh, legislation that is trying to equate between the existence of the state as such, that is, as institutions that provide services to citizens, regardless of who they are, with uh, the ideological project that Zionism uh, represents, and therefore they become inseparable. So any critique of the ideological project, any critique of the questionable, questionable policies of the ideological representative uh, of uh, the, the Zionist uh, uh, movement, will become an existential uh, attack on the state itself instead of handling it in the political arena. So this will lead to a criminalization of dissent and the exclusion of uh, any proper political uh, discussion. Obviously, this kind of law is targeting the uh, uh, mainly, if not exclusively, the Arab citizens of Israel because they have been the ones, specifically in the last 15 years, who are trying to commemorate the uh, Nakba and to uh, introduce the uh, Palestinian narrative that is critical of the Zionist ethos and the orthodox Zionist historical uh, narrative uh, that is uh, being uh, promulgated, promulgated inside Israel. Um, and that included also uh, visits uh, to the ruined uh, villages uh, that had been ethnically cleansed in 1948. Uh, in order to raise uh, awareness uh, of these uh, villages, of this historical uh, narrative, and the existence of internally displaced persons who have lived in these villages before 1948 and now continue to live inside Israel, but in other uh, adjacent communities. So these kind of laws are also not, not only, it's, it's not only the fear of memory, that is the Zionist project is afraid of memory, we already talked about their fear from equality, now we are talking about the fear of the memory of the past, of the historical injustice on which the state has been uh, founded in its founding act. We're also thinking about possible distributive uh, impact of such laws by preventing the return of the internal space persons into these uh, ruined villages that are being commemorated as part of the Nakba. We've also received several questions from friends of ours via social media. From Fayyad on Twitter, he asked, are discriminatory laws in this right-wing coalition government simply less subtle than the ones in practice for decades now? And on Facebook, Doug Sibley asked, How can Israel claim to be a democracy when one group suppresses all other groups and gets away with it? On the one hand, there is, there is this sense that these are um, uh, new bottles but uh, old wine. That is, the uh, inherently discriminatory um, elements of the Zionist uh, project in, inside uh, Israel and Palestine uh, being founded on uh, Jewish uh, supremacy and granting collective advantages to one ethnic, religious, and even biological uh, group and excluding those who do not belong to this national group. So this has been uh, uh, always there in the in the Zionist uh, project and the establishment uh, of Israel. But what we see now is that there is more explicit uh, attempt to um, legalize ethnocentric elements. And there is, of course, a very uh, concrete context to which, uh, in which these uh, uh, laws are being uh, enacted. And this context is on the one hand, the rise of the right wing within the Zionist continuum. So at least since 1977, we see there is a solid majority for the right wing within the Jewish vote inside Israel. And 
Further, after the failure of the Camp David negotiations in uh, 2000, and then the outbreak of the Intifada, and then the brutal uh, repression of the Intifada, and the October 2000 uh, demonstrations of Palestinians inside Israel by the uh, security apparatus uh, in the West Bank, uh, Gaza, and also inside Israel, we see more and more ethnocentric uh, orientations within the Israeli uh, legislature and the Israeli uh, policies uh, in general. Specifically, since the Camp David negotiations and the October 2000 demonstrations have highlighted within the the mindset of the Israeli ruling elite the Arab uh, problem. So, the Arab Palestinian citizens within Israel became uh, a threat to the Jewish nature of the state because the Camp David negotiations and the Oslo process were conceived as an attempt to protect the Jewishness of the state by relinquishing the control of millions and millions and millions of non-Jews. But now, the Palestinian citizens of Israel since the mid-90s with agendas like state of all citizens and demanding full equality have been challenging the ethnocentric nature of the state and therefore demanding the dismantling of all those aspects that discriminate against them because they are non-Jews. So now, since the 2000s, we have more and more legislation that is trying to protect and entrench the ethnocentric elements of uh, of the state and to prevent any liberal attempt, such as by uh, certain judges of the Supreme Court, to uh, undermine the ethnic disc- discriminatory nature of certain policies, specifically those that are in- in- integral to the Zionist project, such as allocation of land and settlement. And of course, the fact that we have less and less immigration to Israel after the 90s, after the Russian immigration in the 90s, we had millions of uh, uh, supposedly Jews coming to uh, Israel. But since then, we don't have these waves of immigration in which the state have uh, tried to uh, ensure the uh, main, maintaining the Jewish majority within uh, the state. And therefore, these laws are part of this effort and becoming uh, more and more explicit given the more and more explicit challenge of the Palestinian state. And on Twitter, we received one question from Diana Butu. She asked um, whether analysts' indications that the racist legislation could be struck down by the high court. Well, what's your view of this? So I, th- I think this is highly unlikely uh, that th- this would be the case. Let us distinguish between two, uh, two uh, factors. On the one hand, is there a space within the Israeli legal language in which these measures can be uh, challenged? Obviously, yes. And therefore, we see that I think we already have some petitions by human rights organizations within Israel challenging uh, some of these uh, laws and will be uh, challenging them uh, more um, in uh, the the future. But on the other hand, the uh, international law is not uh, entirely binding within the domestic legal system because even when the state has signed uh, uh, international conventions such as the Convention on Elimination of All Sorts of Ethnic of racial uh, discrimination, the state did not ratify it within the Israeli domestic law, and therefore it is not uh, legally binding uh, in the legal system. But the more important question is, what is the current Supreme Court in its current composition will do? And we know, given the the, the kind of judges we have, and they are more and more right-wing in the last uh, decade, and they have approved, approved many uh, ethnic and uh, uh, right-wing measures by the government. For example, the fact that the court ha- has actually upheld the, um, the uh, citizenship, citizenship law with regards to family uh, unification, which basically breaks up uh, Palestinian family units and prevents the naturalization of the spouses of the Palestinian citizens inside Israel if they are from basically half the Middle East but specifically the West Bank and Gaza. So if you compare what the Supreme Court in Israel has, uh, its performance, to the performance of other courts within wicked legal systems, such as slavery in the United States, the Supreme Court of the United States under Jim Crow, and the, um, the, let's say, the Court of Appeals under the apartheid regime in South Africa, you would see that 
In certain fundamental issues, these court, courts have performed much better than the Israeli Supreme Court. So, for example, in the case of family or protecting uh, family units and family life and uh, love life of uh, couples um, w under the control of uh, these regimes, we see that the Supreme Court of the United States and Loving versus Virginia, for example, outlawed the anti-miscegenation laws that prevented mixed uh, couples from marrying. And in Kumani Novo versus Bantu administration in South Africa in the 1980s, we also see that the Court of Appeals of South Africa has declared the governmental uh, policy that prevented the spouse of uh, black workers in urban white areas from joining them as uh, unconstitutional. So even there, we saw that these courts have uh, performed better than the Supreme Court. So, and also uh, with the rise of the right wing within the Supreme Court, I don't expect that the court will uh, produce uh, better uh, results in these cases, although this will remain to be seen. Thank you for your time, Nimad. We enjoyed having you on Palestine Studies TV. Thank you very much for your work. If you enjoy watching Palestine Studies TV, do us a favor. Connect with us on our Facebook group or link with us through Twitter. And while you're at it, please donate to the Institute for Palestine Studies so we can continue providing this kind of programming for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.